hey, I'm version two beta. That's version, the number two, and beta, as in life, version two, beta. Uh, it's my handle in most places online. Um, I'm also known as Rob, and under very select circumstances, dad. <laughs> <clears throat> so, smell is strong. I don't mean the smell in this room. I mean that olfaction, our sense of smell is a powerful sense. It's potent in the moment, sometimes overwhelmingly, but it's also tightly coupled with our memory, especially our emotional memory. Very often, a certain smell will be accompanied by a feeling of safety or fear or love or anger. I still remember the way this girl in high school smelled. We were at a forensics competition, uh, regionals, and we both got knocked out before lunch. So we uh, went to the gym where we were supposed to all hang out. We played kind of this backwards game of, uh, of egg toss. So we'd toss it, and then every time we caught it, we'd get a little closer together. Um, I still remember how she smelled that day. I mean, like, really. And it's true still today. I mean, I saw her last a couple of years ago. And it turns out this thing that we have in our DNA called major histocompatibility complex, and we can smell it in each other. Histocompatibility is a quick way for us to tell by smell whether we have com uh, compatible immune systems. Despite what we say about code smells, this sniff test may be better for selecting a mate than selecting an open source library, or even an open source library programmer. But keep the smell stuff in mind because this presentation is about connecting with people authentically. And sometimes that means getting close enough to smell them. Let's do that. Now, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Smile nervously if it helps. Come on, <laughs> I'll wait here. He didn't even put down his pen. Come on, got to smell somebody. <laughs> Say something awkward. That's how most people do it. Gemma? <laughs> <Something> <laughs> okay, I'm going to let you off the hook. <laughs> Only because, well, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> okay. It would be. Well, yeah, but I know he's like six feet away from you. That's awful. <laughs> okay. So, shifting. Uh, it, this presentation is about forming authentic connections with other programmers, specifically the ones who wrote the code libraries, the modules, plugins, add-ons, etc., that you use every day. It's about finding new programmers to connect with and about using those connections to help us find new libraries that we need. I'm not suggesting that you adopt an open source programmer. That sounds patronizing. I'm not suggesting that you befriend an open source programmer. That sounds pitying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am suggesting that we recognize that we're already in interdependent and mutually valuable relationships with other developers of libraries that we use. I'm suggesting that we honor those connections. We don't do it, we won't do it because it's a good idea. We will do it and we are doing it because it's part of making what we do and who we are into a single holistic experience. Let's shift for a moment to software, to picking out an open source library. Drupal.org lists almost 17,000 freely available modules. Let's say your employer wants you to be an expert on all of the available Drupal modules and is willing to let you spend 10 minutes on each one. There's job security in that. <laughs> It'll take you two years working full time to get through them all, not including the new ones that are released while you're doing the project. Do you use WordPress? Some? Okay. Has anybody ever heard of WordPress? 27% of the web runs on it. It's amazing, 27%. Uh, 
Um, they have 37,703 plugins to choose from as of two days ago. <clears throat> Nearly 7,000 of them call themselves widgets. <laughs> um, surely there should be a plugin for anything you need for WordPress, if only you could find it, the needle in the haystack. Any JavaScript programmers? Uh, when I first gave this presentation two years ago, almost two years ago, there were 37,160 libraries in the NPM uh, registry. Today there are 146,000, less than two years. I program a little bit in Python and I have five open source libraries I wrote and I maintain that are in PyPy, the cheese shop. Uh, but the cheese shop has almost 81,160 libraries total. That's more than double the 35,000 that they had in August of 2013. For every one of my libraries, there are 16,000 libraries maintained by someone else or not maintained at all. I used to be a Perl programmer. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't have a job that expects me to know all of the Perl modules. CPAN has 150,000 modules. That's up 25,000 modules from two years ago. When we're looking for a code library, we pay attention to several characteristics. We need to know what the library will do. Uh, these are the typical features. We might consider whether the project is actively maintained. Commit frequency is useful for this. A project that hasn't been updated in a while is probably not actively maintained. Or maybe it's stable and it doesn't need more development. We'll often rely on our peers to show us which cliff to jump off of. So we might look at the number of times other people have downloaded a library or ratings other people have given it, or maybe just how many people have favorited the library on GitHub. We want to know that the programming is reasonably well done, so maybe we'll evaluate the code quality. After all, if we rely on the library and the developer doesn't maintain it, we're going to have to. When we choose to use a library, we're also choosing to create new interfaces, new edges in our code and in our process. Just to clarify, most of the time when I say edge, I'm referring to graph theory. You see it in network diagrams, right? You have nodes connected by lines to other nodes. The lines are called the edges. How and where they connect, that's the interfaces. What's true in mathematics is almost always true in life. So. When you hear me say something like, all of the interesting stuff happens at the edges, I'm not limited to graph theory. Okay, back to coding. There's an edge between my code and someone else's code. There's an edge between my coding practices and somebody else's coding practices. There's an edge between the needs of my project and the needs that a library was written to meet. There's an edge between myself and the developer who wrote the library. There's an edge between my needs and the needs of the developer who wrote the library. And there's an edge between my expectations and the expectations of the developer who wrote the library. When things go beautifully, all of the edges mesh together well. But when they go poorly, it's, it's the kind of grinding you hear from a teenager in a car with a manual transmission. <laughs> Instead of edges, instead of interfaces, the edges represent conflict. So we have gears that aren't meshing. We have interfaces that have crashed into one another. We have conflict in our code, in our needs, in our expectations, even between us and the developer. How do we resolve that conflict? Or better yet, how do we avoid it? I've had the opportunity over the past decade or so to watch a number of Bollywood films. If that helps, take a moment and picture me dancing and singing in Hindi. <laughs> There's an interesting difference between Bollywood films and American films. <clears throat> 
In American films, when the leading man first sees the leading woman, he tends to size her up in that male gaze and then assess the um, potential for a hookup. In a Bollywood film, when the man first sees the woman, he also sizes her up with a male gaze, but he pictures her in her wedding gown with henna on. <clears throat> if it's a particularly racy Bollywood film, she'll be in her wedding gown, but it'll be off on one shoulder and she'll be on the bed already. Believe it or not, when we select an open source library, we're doing the same thing. We're projecting the satisfaction of our needs onto the object of our desire, uh, the, the code. <laughs> <clears throat> the library, and you know, maybe the woman in the movie too, is really just the reflection of ourselves. And like the guy in the movie, sometimes we're disappointed once we have real experience with the real thing. And therein lies the conflict. We have expectations and they might not be compatible with the code. <clears throat> the resolution from these conflicts, the resolution of these conflicts comes from understanding the developer's expectations as well as understanding our own. And that understanding comes from connection, which in turn comes from trust. So there's a difficult question. Who can you trust? We can often understand someone's motivations and expectations if we understand their needs. Abraham Maslow helped us organize those needs into a hierarchy. Conveniently, it's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And since we're relying on Maslow's work, let's quickly introduce him. If there's one thing I hope you can take away from this presentation, it's to learn about the people upon whom you rely. So I'm sure you've already heard of Maslow because you've probably heard of Maslow's hammer, or at least you've heard about Maslow's hammer. He originated the phrase, it's tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything like a nail. Uh, Abraham Maslow grew up in Brooklyn, the oldest of seven children of Jewish parents who fled the Holocaust. As a child, he was bullied mercilessly, mercis, mercilessly, uh, mostly uh, because of his ancestry. Psychologists at that time classified him as mentally unstable. As an adult, he became one of our most important research psychologists, teaching at Brandeis and Brooklyn, the New School for Social Research in Columbia University. Throughout his life, he had a horrible relationship with his mother, which reportedly inspired his interest in understanding people's needs. Maslow had a massive heart attack while, giant, while jogging and died at 62 years old. That was about 46 years ago. Maslow created a pyramid describing human needs. At the bottom, we have our basic physiological needs like eating and drinking, peeing and crapping, breathing, sleeping, sex. Once our physiological needs are met, we're better, better able to focus on our higher needs, like being safe and healthy, having a secure job and home, maintaining our moral code. After we've addressed the needs of our body and our future, we can start truly to work on our sense of belonging, having friends, intimacy, love, and family. Once we have stable social structures, we turn inward and work on ourself, self-esteem, self-respect sense of achievement. Finally, after we've found ways to satisfy all of these needs, we address our need to be self-actualized, to accept our role within reality and our responsibility to help create the world that we live in. It's what I do with code, right? I'm helping to create the world we live in. Generally speaking, we can use Maslow's hierarchy to understand ourselves and other people. We're all human, we all have needs, and we all need each other. Let's get back to some of the interesting stuff that happens at the edges. Where there's an edge, there's a potential for conflict. What we need instead of conflict is connection. 
This is well demonstrated by Maslow's hierarchy. We need to know where we belong. We need to hold ourselves in high esteem. We need to be self-actualized. When we work, we are actively meeting those needs. When a developer writes a library, she's also meeting those needs. When we use a library and connect with the person or the community behind it, we're meeting those needs together. This builds the connection that replaces the conflict. It's the foundation for understanding and trust. It is self-actualization. One-to-one, -one, it's us creating the wholeness of ourselves. We're part of larger social networks. This includes Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, but it also includes our friends and our lovers, our co-workers and our cohorts. A quick review of graph theory, the connections between us are edges, and we each are a node. You might find it interesting that node comes from the Latin word nodus, which means not, K-N-O-T, not. As in, your node is a spot where the edges are tied in a knot. That's how it goes. You're in the network, you're surrounded by edges, and you are tied up. Robin Dunbar, Robin Ian McDonald Dunbar, has put together some really excellent research on how connected we are. Dunbar is an anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist, which is pretty much what I want to be when I grow up, either that or a farmer. Among other achievements, like being department head at Oxford, he has a number named after him, Dunbar's number. Basically represents the approximate number of people with whom we can maintain stable social relationships. It's suggested of our cognitive limit in our ability to connect. Dunbar's number is commonly accepted at 150, meaning that we can maintain stable social relationships with about 150 people. In reality, Dunbar's number isn't a single number. It's a range from about 120 to about 230. According to his most recent research, the actual value of the number for any given individual depends on that person's social brain, specifically the orbital medial prefrontal cortex. In fact, Dunbar's 2012 paper has demonstrated a correlation between the size of an individual's orbital medial prefrontal cortex and the size of their social network. I'm a parent. I am a parent. I'm also a parent in front of you, right? Not an apparition, I don't know. I am a parent. <laughs> Over the years, it's become obvious how underdeveloped a child's prefrontal cortex can be and how it's my responsibility to provide that capacity for them as they're growing. But what does our prefrontal cortex do? First and foremost, as demonstrated by Dunbar's research, the prefrontal cortex does our social information processing. So it helps us keep track of the people with whom we're connected. It's where our theory of mind lives, the ability to recognize that other people have their own experiences and that their experiences are different from our own. It's also where we do our planning, both short-term but complicated motor planning, like tying a shoelace but also long-term and even more complicated planning, like me becoming an anthropologist, an evolutionary biologist, or maybe a farmer. The prefrontal cortex also houses our working memory, the stuff we're actively chewing on. If you're still listening to me, that's also because of your prefrontal cortex. It's responsible for our attention. Far from least, the prefrontal cortex is a processing center for language and symbolic thought. So here's something interesting that I can point out. Every one of these functions is important to us as developers. We use the same mental skills keeping track of code objects and past messages that we use keeping track of social networks. We're constantly planning, whether it's keeping track of the, the current sprint 
or keeping track of the next line of code that we were going to type. <clears throat> Figuring out that next line of code totally taxes our working memory. And getting it down on the screen is all about language and symbolic processing. Contrary to some t uh, stereotypes, we developers are all about the prefrontal cortex. We're jacked into that network. It's not just how we relate, it's where we live. We want to uh, want to hear something really interesting. The prefrontal cortex, specifically the orbital medial area, is also responsible for olfaction, our sense of smell. Feel free to smell your neighbor again. As you might imagine, there's been a lot of recent work into figuring out what these connections are worth. One of the earlier rules came from Robert Metcalf. Anybody know that name, Robert Metcalf? Uh, you might recognize the name. He graduated from MIT with two bachelor degrees about a thousand years ago, the same year I was born. Um, he was so impressed by ARPANET, which is the, the predecessor to our current internet, that he made it the topic of his PhD dissertation uh, at Harvard. Uh, they flunked him. <laughs> so he went on to instead co-invent Ethernet and start a company called 3Com. Metcalf's law says that the value of, of a telecommunications network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users. David Reed was also educated at MIT just a couple of years behind Robert Metcalf. In the 80s, he was a visiting scientist at the MIT Media Lab, America's foremost school of wizardry. David Reed invented UDP, but he finds that statement a little absurd since what he really did was co-invent TCP and then figured, hey, we should have an easier version of it too. <laughs> Reed's law says that the utility of large networks particularly social networks, increases exponentially with the size of the network. Rod Beckstrom is a youngster. He's only 54 years old now. He's a Stanford grad, and he spends a lot of time thinking about organizational theory. For a while, he directed the National Cybersecurity Center, but he quit that job when the NSA decided they were in charge of it. He uh, has also run ICANN, the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers, and he's on the board of trustees for the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, one of my favorite things about him is that he presented Beckstrom's Law at DEF CON, the world's largest hacking conference. Beckstrom's Law says that the value of a network equals the net value added by each user's transactions conducted through that network multiplied by the number of users. So at least three experts agree that networks get more valuable as they grow and that the value increases non-linearly. The more connections you have, the bigger the payoff. The value is not retained solely by the people who own the networks. If that were the case, we wouldn't use their networks, would we? <laughs> we use Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and GitHub because they provide value to us. And as the value of the network to us personally goes up, the value of the network to us personally goes up as our network grows. Typically, at least until we get somewhere around Dunbar's number. I'm gonna back this up with anecdotal evidence. Um, I'm not a particularly strong programmer. Uh, for the last five years, I've tried to make a point of getting better, in part, by knowing the people who wrote the libraries I, I use and put on the podcasts that I listen to. So about three years ago, one of those people heard I was looking for a job. And he said I should come interview at the place he worked. And I said, nope, I'm not a good enough coder. I worked my ass off for about a year. And um, then I tweeted back at the same guy. And he took some time out from a conference he was at to talk with me on IRC. And then he got me an interview with five engineers at his company. And then they flew me out here for two days of pairing at their office. And then they gave me an offer that met every need I had, including moving me and my family from Wisconsin to
to Utah, one of the most beautiful places I've ever lived. And I went to school in Maine. I mean, like, Maine's pretty beautiful too. I didn't do any of this on my own. I connected with other people, open source developers who maintain libraries of their own, and they helped make it happen. And I know that me and my network were going places. Enough about coding, let's talk about food, metaphorically. Many of us buy our food from the grocery store. We look at the tomatoes and we check out their color and we feel their firmness and, and we decide which ones we want to buy based on the characteristics of the fruit. That's how we choose open source libraries too. But I want you to be a foodie. I don't want you to just go to the store and check out the fruit. I want you to go to the farmer's market and check out the farmers. Get to know them. Go volunteer to work on their farms. Try to understand what they're choosing to grow and why. Is that heirloom tomato a specialty? Or was it a one-time experiment? Where's the parsley? What happened to the potatoes they had last year? You only know the answer to these questions if you know the farmer. The same goes for your coding. Instead of physical location, your community is a group of people who work on the same code base. You know, whether it's WordPress or Joomla, Python or Ruby or, or Node.js. Get to know the farmers in your community and learn which libraries are their staples and which ones are their experiments. Learn what's important to them and go back to their code base when you're looking for something new. After all, we're not here at this conference because we want to buy the tomatoes. We're here at this conference because we want to be better farmers. And you don't become a better farmer by studying the fruit at the supermarket. Uh, in keeping with the topic, I want to actively appreciate a lot of the people who helped put this presentation together. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, wow. Like, silence. Chirp, chirp. Uh, so I run a, a commercially backed open source project. Cool. And one of the challenges I have is, you know, I think you do a great job of explaining the value of increasing the size of the connectedness in the network. Yes. How do I make my project more appealing so that people want to connect? By connecting with people. Um, somebody is there, you, you reach out to them. Somebody has put in a, a pull request, you respond promptly. You, you reach out, you pull them in, you connect with them. It's all authentic connections. And the less authentic and the less connected we are, the, the weaker those connections are going to be. And you can't build a community around that. I really hear you when you say how great it is to have a project that's kind of built of people who understand one another and are friends, and that's, that helps hold the project together. But the dark side of that is that if those social relationships end for whatever reason, it can decimate the project in a way that it wouldn't necessarily if they kept, um, if they'd been just strictly professional with each other uh -huh. rather than being socially friends as well. Do you have any thoughts on how to avoid the potential damage Sure, yeah. So um, that sounds like the, the, uh, the problem where you have people who are too close together, you know, don't sleep with your coworkers. Um, and decimate means, you know, destroying 10%. Mm -hmm. um, I was like that. We use decimate and, and literally it means losing 10%. So that's change. And I don't think change is all bad. Um, and sometimes it's good to like be careful or, or watch the way that we talk about things because it informs how we think about things. So there are a lot of projects where they've split and they forked and they fell apart and other people picked up the pieces. And, um, and the result of that is often that you get new projects that are going different directions um, or that you get projects that just, you know, nobody is going to pick up anymore because they're a little bit too toxic. And yeah, I think it comes down to making sure that the community is strong enough um, so that the community can survive a change in leadership. 
So it, it seems like the you talk a lot about the open source community, and uh, you reference ESR's Cathedral Bazaar mm -hmm. paper, and I feel like there's there's been a change in the tenor of the open source world in the last five seven years with the rise of GitHub coincident with the rise of open source is just a standard operating procedure for businesses. Mm -hmm. so you see like React from Facebook, Angular from Google, yep. Bootstrap from Twitter, where they're open source as a matter of course, but typically under MIT Apache licenses on a centralized, decentralized registry. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it feels like a lot of the, the growth, maybe it's the growth in that network has reduced the communality or the yeah maybe like common identity that you see in like the, the free software world. How does that affect the, the way people connect when when open source is so often sponsored by a corporation? It's like, well, yeah, we're putting this out there. It's not a core business component, but really, what we have is a team of full time engineers working on this. Like so I'd like to suggest that that's another way to do it. You can build community, or you can buy it. Microsoft Open Source .net doesn't mean they fired all their programmers. Does that address the question? It's more, I, I guess, does the approach of trying to connect with people work along the, the open source lines when open source feels like it's becoming less about people? Um, I guess it depends on which part of open source you're looking at. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe we are in uh, the middle of a takeover, a corporate takeover of open source. It's entirely possible. Um, and maybe, you know, we're going to choose to um, align ourselves with, with this one corporate overlord or another, or, or maybe, you know, continue as anarchists in our own projects. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I work on the Erlang stuff, and um, one of the things that's kind of cool there is, you know, that they were started by Ericsson right up until they were banned within Ericsson, and all of the programmers left, formed their own company called Blue Tail. Um, and they open sourced Erlang, Ericsson did, and uh, and like that's kind of when it took off to be, you know, the gigantic community of programmers it is now. Not really. <laughs> um, so, but Ericsson still works on Erlang. It ended up being unbanned. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, you know, I think that we create the communities we're part of. Um, we don't have full control by any means. Or um, those of us who are not the benevolent dictator of an open source community don't have, well, even they don't have full control. They just have a little more influence than the rest of us, right? So I don't know. Yeah. Shape your communities, the ones that you're in. And sometimes you choose your communities based on the shape of them. I was going to say, I feel like in some ways, um, a brand identity and an individual identity in open source function very similarly. Absolutely. Um, if the brand identity um, does something that harms somebody, then they're going to not want to work with the brand anymore, just like they would not want to work with an individual anymore. Or if the brand puts out code, then it's kind of regarded as responsible for maintaining it, just like an individual would do. Yeah, absolutely. But then it's never individuals speaking as their company who actually talk to people. It's always people speaking as them, and they happen to be employees. <laughs> <laughs> but keep in mind, you know, when we associate with those, when we, when we work on those projects, when we use the code, when we become connected with it, with that community, it's tribe. It's identity. You know, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, Mozilla Project or, or you know, working on .NET open source or, or whatever else. I mean, what are some other examples of, of, of groups where you can work with them, but really it's also our sense of identity. I've done that with OpenBSD. You know, it's a, a highly security-oriented security operating system. And the people who are involved in it, they, you know, it's, it's part of who they are. It's part of how they see themselves. There are other communities. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Love Arch Linux. All of the docs and the yeah, fix it yourself here will help you. Mm -hmm. Yep. But you can do that even in the bigger um, corporate-driven open source projects too, right? You can identify yourself with it, um, brand yourself, become part of a tribe. Any other questions? So you got networks with, uh, you can say a networking 
one network has a value of, let's say, order n squared uh -huh. for participants, another one exponential. Sure. I mean, what kind of attributes are different between those two networks to cause them to have different values? Well, according to the research, you know, one of them is a telecommunications network and the other is a social network. But I, I don't, I, I'm sure that there are ways to answer that from sociology. Um, but, and uh, economics, but I, I don't know what they are. I just know that, um, that we can see that played out in our lives. And uh, it's probably an interesting question, you know, what is the true value of an individual's private Twitter network? How would you measure that? Uh, uh, see, you have to start with, you know, definitions and metrics. Um, but it's been done, huh? I was saying, there are companies that are trying. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like, your clout score is a value, right? <laughs> and literally, it's a value of your Twitter network. Yeah, the fact that we're all laughing is you brought that up. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your clout score is a useless value. Right. Uh, and, you know, not much better than a guess. I don't know. Yeah. And it's true, the company has some ability to influence with its resources, but that's being bringing people into that. Uh, you mentioned that you can either grow a community or you can buy a community. I work for a company that tried buying a community. It didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> Growing a community by enabling our engineers to participate is far more effective sure. for all the reasons that you discussed. Yeah. Well, I think that if you can pay a team of developers to develop your source code, that works too. And you know, you've got their loyalty as long as they have their paychecks. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, certainly a lot of what we do is based on that. Um, I, I talked about this yesterday morning. They pay us stupid amounts of money to do this work, right? I can't go become a farmer and make anything like this. There's really not anything else I can do that would pay me comparable amounts of money. But you don't gain the benefits of the wider network that Simply a open source project would unless those engineers are also participating and forming personal relationships. In right. So now you're talking about combining the two, yeah. buying your network and building your community. I've, I've seen, I think, companies trying to buy social influence by hiring on the um, noteworthy developers. Absolutely, yeah. Like, it's so weird how some projects weren't started within a given company, but like most of the core team just ends up there. Because uh -huh. once you get critical mass saying it's a nice place, Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I've got a customer that has been using box.com on a node project that I wrote for them several years ago. Um, and we hate it. Um, we hate box, we hate node, we hate my code, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're rewriting it now in Python with Dropbox. And of course, Guido von Rossum. Mm -hmm is at Dropbox, um, as well as a number of other people who are important in the Python community. Any more? Get out of here two and a half minutes early? <laughs> All right, thank you.